We're moving on to chapter seven of the Mechanics Year Two course. And this is a bit of an odd chapter because this really is where the hardest mechanics questions come from, but it's also where pretty much most of the uh, exam paper questions come from. Pretty much every exam you're gonna have a question which is some kind of chapter seven question. On the other hand, there isn't really any new maths in this chapter. Everything is applications of things that we've done before, and we start to kind of categorise all the mechanics questions into um, about five or six different kinds that go in this chapter. Now, when I say all of them, the projectiles questions are different, uh, the, uh, some of the SUVAC questions are different, and things. There, there, are, there are a couple of other topics, but I'd say probably half the course is solidified into this chapter. Everything to do with um, things being pulled up and down slopes, things sitting on tables, things going uh, over pulleys and all that sort of thing. Um, most of the moments questions really can be seen as, as a subsection of this chapter as well. So um, this chapter really is a set of examples and exercises to get you used to that. So this is going to be the most useful if you are working through in order uh, these videos and you'll see just examples of the different kinds of questions that we're going to do, really. And that's all I'm going to do. There is no new information. I'm just going to show you the examples and how they work. So, <clears throat> first thing we can have, if you look at exercise 7a, unlikely to come up too much, I think, on an A-level exam, but it might be there on, as the first question for a few marks to kind of get us going. What we have is just a load of forces, and it says here we're static. So if we're static, then we're in equilibrium. When you hear the word equilibrium, you should think to yourself that the forces balance out, and the resultant force is zero, and that the moments clockwise equal the moments anti-clockwise. Now with these questions, all of the forces start at one point and move outwards from there. So there are no moments involved, there's no turning effect, it's just, um, it's just forces. Now, um, I'll take the same example that the book does. We've got 45 degrees there, we've got 30 degrees there, and we've got a vertical downwards force here. So that's four, that's P, and that's Q. Now, we don't have to worry in any mechanics question, we don't worry about what's missing and what's there and adjust our methods. We look at the situation that we've got and we apply the methods that fit that situation and then the answers will come out of our equations. So in this case, I know it's static. Vertical forces, upwards forces equal downward forces. I'm gonna resolve vertically and I'm gonna get from this force here, I get an upward component of four sine 45. There's the hypotenuse opposite this angle. So four sine 45 degrees, oops, degrees. P sine 30 degrees. Those are the two upwards forces. The downwards force is Q. Resolving horizontally, we get a horizontal component from this force, which is four cos 45 degrees. We get a horizontal component from this force pushing the other way, which is going to be P cos 30 degrees, and those are our two equations. There's no horizontal component from this force. That's equation number one, that's equation number two. Now if we look at the equations, what have we got? Well I've got two equations with two unknowns. P and Q are the only things that I don't know in these two equations. Equation two will tell me the value of P, and then I can substitute that into equation one. Um, so it's it's simultaneous equations, but it's not too tricky simultaneous equations. We do have some nasty decimals flying around. Oh no, we don't even have that because we've got cos, and, uh, cos of 45 and 30, and those are things that we know the exact values of. So from there, I'm going to leave this question because the mechanics is done with. Okay. Now, uh, the, they also do this in the book by the triangular forces method. Um, <clears throat> if the resultant force is zero, remember that these forces are vectors. So the resultant of a vector is what you get when you add the vectors together. So P plus Q plus that force of size four, add together to make a triangle because the resultant force uh, is the vector sum and the vector sum needs to be zero. So that plus that plus that, we go back to the start. We don't tend to do things by that technique, but sometimes um, it might be useful just to make sure that we have the idea here. If I keep the line of P going and I put a horizontal line in here, I know that this angle here is 30 degrees. Um, I know that that line four there goes at 45 degrees, and that's enough information to um, say, well, this one here must be 30 degrees as well, then by X angles. So this must be 60 degrees because these two add up to 90. 
If that's 45 degrees there, then this must be 45 degrees here because this is vertical and this is horizontal. And that 60 and 45 add together with 75 to make 180. So there's the triangle of forces method. But I suspect very few people use that unless we're specifically instructed to use it. More common is this method here. The other thing that can come up in this situation um, is if I have forces going um, more, instead of thinking vertically and horizontally, it's more useful if I think in an x direction like this and a y direction like this. Now, this is a very unusual question because if this comes up, it's probably going to be an object sitting on a slope. Um, so it's almost certainly going to be an in context sort of a thing. Um, but since it's there, we'll go through the example. The, the, the only way of helping you, I think, on this exercise is to go through some examples and hopefully that will help out. Remember that if we've got 30 degrees here, we can extend this line perpendicular to the slope and we can label that angle there as the same as this one here. Um, now then, where do we go? Well, let's go perpendicular to the slope first of all. We're told it's static, so we're going to resolve forces. Forces out from the slope are two newtons from there. P sine alpha. By the way, if you're not happy getting these uh, P sine alphas and uh, five cos alphas and things, then you need to make sure you kind of go back and practice those. That are, in previous videos, I've given an explanation of where those come from. So 5 cos 30 degrees, and that's equation number one. I'm not going to stop and think about it. I'm not going to look at it. Oh, I don't need to put the newtons in the equation, do I? So 2 plus P sine alpha equals 5 cos 30. That's the equation. Uh, the force is pushing out equals force you're pushing in. I've considered all four forces. This force here doesn't push out and doesn't push in because it's going parallel. Let's resolve forces parallel. I know it's not accelerating. I know it's static. So forces down the slope equal forces up the slope. Forces down the slope is 8. And the downward component of this force plus 5 sine 30 degrees. Up the slope, I've got P cos alpha. There's equation 2. And now <clears throat> I've got that situation, so I've applied these two equations. Now I've got these equations, I can stop and look at them, stop and look at the question and say, well, what is it actually asking us for? What it's asking us for is P and alpha. I've got two simultaneous equations, each with a P and an alpha in. But from this point onwards, it's just solving simultaneous equations. Okay, So um, I'm not going to carry on from there. The, the, the solution is in the blue box on page 130 anyway. But from here, it's, it is simultaneous equations. Now, if you're finding that difficult, um, what can we say? If you're finding that difficult, then just think about it as an equation that looks like this. Um, Let's say this is P times um, Y equals, um, I don't know, a constant. So let, 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 I'm, I'm going to change these equations a little bit. Okay, these two equations are of this sort of form, aren't they? They're not quite the same kind of thing because I've got a sine alpha and a cos alpha here. But can you see I've got two unknowns, p and alpha, and here I've got a p and an alpha. So if you took these two equations, they wouldn't be too bad, would they? How we, what, hopefully what you'd do is you'd rearrange one of them. Let's say we'd, we'd take this one and we'd write this one out as, um, well, 8 plus 12 is 20 divided by 2y equals p. So p equals 10 over y, and then you'd take that and you'd substitute it in here. So that these two equations shouldn't scare us. When you look at these two equations, they look a bit more scary, but that's only because this sines and cos is flying around. This is a number, this is a number. I can add those together the same way I could do it. 8 add 12 here. This is two numbers times together, so I can divide through by cos alpha the same way over here I'd manage to divide through by 2y. Um, and then I can substitute what I get, the value for p, into this equation here. And we can work from there. Okay. Um, We'll have a little bit more fiddles to do on the way, but once we've done this, it's not a mechanics problem, it's an algebra problem. Okay? So that is the end of the mechanics. If you get if you're getting to that and you're getting stuck after that, then it's practice on algebra that you need, not practice on mechanics specifically. Um, good luck with those ones. We'll carry on with section 7.2 in the next video.